Good afternoon, excellencies, trustees, students, faculty, staff, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to opening day 2018. Today we have the privilege and the responsibility to launch an even more energetic, successful, um, controversial 2018 after a highly impactful and successful academic year just concluded. A great deal was accomplished and yet much seems incomplete somehow. And it was an eventful year in the sporting world as well. France, of course, won its second World Cup, but I found myself asking, whatever happened to Black, Blanc et Beurre? Unlike the last time that France won in 1998, and unlike the multi-ethnic German win of 2014, it seems that the times could not be more different. The specter of ethnic nationalism has swept much of Europe and the United States, and the 2018 World Cup itself was not spared this phenomenon. From a Russian side, which featured 10 ethnic Russian starters, plus one converted Portuguese Brazilian, to the scapegoating of a 2014 World Cup winner for Germany's historic failure in the tournament, based on an appearance the Turkish descended German made with Turkish President Erdogan, the siren song of racial purity echoed throughout Russia's otherwise faultless display of an even and exciting World Cup. U.S. President Donald Trump added to the drumbeat of isolationism that's been his credo by labeling the European Union an enemy a few days later, all after decrying how sad he was that immigration had changed the face of Europe while he was visiting Britain. Lost in the current immigration noise is the institutional memory of America's rise to scientific primacy in the mid-20th century, fueled by the immigration of brilliant creative minorities seeking escape from the very same ethnic nationalism we're seeing on the rise today. Vannevar Bush, from our board chair's institution, sensing the trends of the Einsteins and Fermis immigrating to America in the interwar period, developed a blueprint for the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Within 20 years, the US became the world leader in scientific discovery as well as military power. Today, America, a nation that disproportionately relies on international students and doctoral graduates to accelerate its scientific research mission and its technological and industrial age may find those students in short supply. The US is faced with policies that not only discourage immigrants from the six mainly Muslim majority nations that were outlined in President Trump's original travel ban, but also has now managed to unwittingly dissuade many from the far and near east, as well as some parts of Africa from committing to graduate and postdoctoral studies in the country that once harbored the world's most endangered refugees. But AUB is different. We inhabit, lead, and embody a patch of fertile dissonance in the Middle East. Ever since 152 years ago, when Presbyterian missionaries founded the American University of Beirut as the Syrian Protestant College. Far more successful at disseminating a secular liberal arts education than it had been in religious conversion, the university took advantage of Lebanon's liberal and diverse population to become a world leader in inclusive education. Battered but unbowed by the Lebanese Civil War, the university has gradually emerged that much stronger for its role as the preeminent seat of higher learning in the Arab world, all while maintaining the spirit of a small liberal arts school. One thing we cannot compromise on, and something that AUB does very well, is to dispel the myths that contribute to fear of the other. We accept students from every political spectrum, every religious background, and 22% of our students are international. While many graduates retain the same political and religious views that they brought with them, they're far less likely to believe in violent confrontation after an AUB experience, and far more accepting of individuals who are different from them in every way. Several universities in Europe have taken on the mantle of inclusive education as a tool for social mobility and societal cohesion, focusing on excellence through diversity. This is by no means 
and overarching list, but the Netherlands much heralded Maastricht University, University College London, Spain's new business school, IE, are among the top European schools that consider the fostering of diversity a means to a healthier society and, in fact, a goal in its own right. Top American universities, both private and public, have long seen this as their duty and as mission essential. Over 13 years in my previous occupation at Emory, we led the recruitment of 95 faculty members and never once worried about an individual's background, except with regard to talent, character, and fit. As the program climbed in the rankings, I believe we got it right in more ways than one. The Cancer Center and the department we led are diverse in many ways, but the quality and character we developed as a mantra remain. As my close friend Otis Raleigh recently pointed out, in fact, today, not many departments in the southeastern United States or divisions of hematology, oncology, even departments of medicine have three full professors who are African American. All three are stars. They're the equals, at least of their Caucasian or Asian peers in rank, but they're not the product of planned recruitment. It's simply focusing on those three things that are essential for us at AUB. Talent, character, and fit. One of the three, Tofika Wanakoko, is himself an immigrant from Nigeria. So the department became a seamless blend of men and women, straight and gay, liberal and conservative, from multi-generational American families and from immigrants, immigrant families. From China and India to Africa and the Middle East, from the Americas to Europe, the American melting pot was the formula that we used to recreate over a decade and a half in one of the most desired cities to move to in the United States, a model of diversity that came together naturally. This was not a work of master planning because that institution's strengths have grown since our departure, but rather it emanates from a deep belief in the potency of Emma Lazarus's words in the New Colossus. She wrote, and these words are inscribed on the Statue of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these the homeless tempest tossed to me, I lift my camp beside the golden door. Later today, I'm going to introduce someone who was seduced by that siren song for very personal reasons. In my generation, Europe was viewed less warmly than the US, in large part due to its colonial history, a source of suspicion and even contempt among the recently colonized, and many would say with good reason. The American dream was prevalent even among young Arabs whose disdain for American foreign policy did not prevent them from admiring a United States genuinely coming to grips with its racist past to forge a more accepting, more inclusive, more ethnically diverse, more multicultural future. During our family's seven happy years in Texas, of all places you may think, in the 1990s, we enjoyed Houston, one of the most diverse cities in the world, and its embrace of all types of diversity from Mexican food to uh, European and African-American music. This was the America that I had grown up dreaming of that we argued for in our teenage years, not the constricted, indifferent, increasingly inward-looking West that we've observed lately. Back to football, and I want to thank people for bearing with me as I talk about my favorite sport, first time ever officially. The optimistic tones of an earlier Europe, the ones that produced the diverse World Cup of 1998, when Zinedine Zidane's face lit up the Arc de Triomphe, have also been ground out by a wave of anxiety that's been really generated by economic stasis, a catastrophe of displaced persons that is more manifest here than any other part of the world, in the, where half of them reside in the Arab world, and the falsely assuring song of partisan nationalist leaders and their call for a return to a glorious past, a past that never was for at least the last 200 years. How is this having an impact? A recent Pew Foundation research poll of the American voter found that while 70% of Republicans believe in the messages of the church 
and other religious authorities, less than 40% in academic institutions. I'll repeat that. 70% of Republicans believe in the messages of the church, less than 40% trust academic institutions. This is the party of Lincoln. Lincoln was the man who freed African Americans, who fought for equality. Those trends are in reverse among Democrats. The picture of a divided society is pervasive today in the West as it is here. And a divided society in Lebanon, in the United States, anywhere, is a less welcoming society. It's true in Europe, it's true in Lebanon. Can universities help bridge that gap, especially when campus debate itself is threatened? What can we do? Shortly after President Trump's election, Columbia professor Mark Lilla bemoaned academic institutions' inability to debate the full spectrum of ideas on our campuses, both liberal and conservative. His subsequent book, the Once and Future Liberal After Identity Politics, which grew out of that New York Times article, picks up the strands started by Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, who focused Ed Did Lilla's original New York Times article on how academia had worked to marginalize and drown out the voice of the American conservative. If his analysis, coming from the perspective of a self-identifying liberal, finds common cause with an avowed conservative and William Buckley, who more than 50 years prior had written in his famous God and Man at Yale about that, si that same drowning out of a particular chorus of voices, we in academia may have missed the message, the message of inclusivity. Perhaps the message needs to be a simpler one, a more inclusive one, and maybe even a reductionist one. So here's my plea for inclusivity based on observations from 23 years as an academic faculty member, administrator, uh, and lightning rod for debate. Inclusivity allows you to select, admit, nurture, and unleash the very best and brightest, the very people who we can help to ensure a better, fairer, more just, and more inclusive world. In fact, recent data from American cities and towns, which had an increase in immigration demonstrated a drop in the incidence of violent crimes despite the publicizing of rare crimes attributable to refugees and unregistered aliens in their country and in the US. These people bring drive, diversity, as well as a palpable thirst for a better tomorrow. And there are brave voices saying that. The father of a young woman murdered by an immigrant decried the polarization and the racism being brought forth in the cause of discussing his daughter's death. Today, you're going to hear the words of one such academician, a symbol of excellence and of inclusiveness. Sir Fraser Stoddard is a Nobel laureate, a chemist of stature, who's played a role in the development of mechanically interlocking molecules leading to the design and synthesis of molecular mas machines. His leadership and his creativity has led to myriad applications in industry, in health and medicine, in environmental protection, in personal care, nutrition, and so on and so forth. In the future, molecular machines could be used for even more new materials, sensors and energy storage systems. Sir Fraser began his journey of discovery, which he's going to talk about, as a young boy in the University of Life in the fertile farmlands around Edinburgh. He received a Scottish education culminating in a Ph.D. degree in chemistry at the University of Edinburgh, which he obtained in just two years. He then worked as a postdoc at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, in Canada, at the University of Sheffield in England, and as an ICI research fellow before joining the academic staff after three years at the company's corporate laboratory in Cheshire. He was named as the chair of chemistry at the University of Birmingham in 1990, and moved in 1997 to UCLA as Saul Winstein Professor of Chemistry. To the great extent, that was because he believed that his beloved wife, Norma, would receive more advanced treatment for her breast cancer in the US, although she tragically uh, died in 2004. But that's the land of opportunity. That's the land of difference. That's what we want to create at AUB and here. 
Sir Fraser moved to Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois in 2008. He established the Mechanochemistry Group and was named the Board of Trustees Professor in Chemistry. And he continues to do his work in now, even after being knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 2007, the same year he won the King Faisal Prize, even after winning the Nobel Prize in 2016 with Ben Frenga and Jean-Pierre Sauvage for the design and synthesis of molecular machines. He continues to do his work teaching, doing groundbreaking research. And we're very grateful to Professor Bilal Kafarani for inviting him today. Thank you, Bilal. So in contrast to the brilliance of Sir Fraser's accomplishments, he's a very modest man, quick to give credit to his peers and his charges. Like Einstein and Fermi, and like so many before you, Sir Fraser, you immigrated to the US and you became a citizen of that great land, contributing so richly to its cultural and academic capital. You're an easy example, but I'd like to say to President Trump and also to General Aum, pass me some more immigrants. They make a difference. As a dual citizen, I can say that to both presidents of the republics that I resi have resided in or reside in. Our future as a human race, not just our scientific future, which is substantially threatened by a downturn in graduate school educations in the US, our future as a human race in the critical areas of the humanities, science, engineering, medicine, strongly suggests that discouraging one group of people from reaching out for their dream can have far broader consequences than those who might intend. Certainly Lebanon and indeed the Arab world's future is also dependent on economic and social reforms at a minimum. These are the kind of reforms that will allow the children of Lebanese mothers to become full Lebanese citizens so that so that this tiny country can retain, nurture, and empower more of the very best and the brightest that it can raise and then it can see flower. To say nothing of a world that while issuing the current and European isolationist trends, I am confident can still hope to believe in the words of Emma Lazarus and the substance of the American dream. And that's something that we can talk about but we also need to do. So, what I'm saying today is our priority, my priority for the next two, five, seven years until the Board of Trustees wakes up and decides to get a better president is to create a $100 million fund for, to get the best and brightest kids from Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and Iraq to start with, to study at AUB, to bond together as leaders. We're committed to raising this money, the Board and I, so that these people can create lives that are more abundant, more meaningful, and more powerful, like what you're about to hear from Sir Fraser Stoddard. Sir Fraser. President of this august institution, uh, honorable members of the faculty, uh, ladies and gentlemen, students, I'm greatly honored to be here standing before you today. I come from a small country, Scotland, to speak to you here in a small country, the Lebanon. If I address my remarks mainly in the beginning to the young people, I'd like to say, I cannot become like you, but you can become like me. By considering my own life's journey, let me suggest <clears throat> how you could become like me. Like is the important and operative word here. You cannot be me, you can only be yourself. Well, I was born in Edinburgh in the middle of a war in 1942. And shortly thereafter, my parents moved to a tenant farm 
about 12 miles south of the capital. And it was there that I was part of what I began to call the University of Life in recent days or recent times. Because it was an experience in upbringing that was rather unique. I was an only child. I had to depend on a few children that would come and stay in the cottages, which helped to support the farm life. When these children were around, we played free of any inhibitions from our parents. We were able to roam around for <clears throat> miles and miles in every direction, um, to go to reservoirs, to be in streams or what the Scots called burns, or in the winter time, sledging around hills that were covered with snow. It was a wonderful, as it were, experience of just freedom. As far as toys went, they were few and far between. And the only one that I really recall in a big way were jigsaws. And I became addicted to jigsaws. <clears throat> and to that extent, I think they set the pattern for my interest in one part of chemistry, which is called stereochemistry, where shape is very important. What else did I learn on the farm? Well, since the farm went from a horse and cart era to a combine harvester era during the 25 years that I was part of the farm, I learned that change was happening around me all the time. And bless my father, he kept up with that change. If there was a new instrument, a new contraption, he would buy it. And that has stayed with me ever since in my laboratory experience. The other thing that uh, I recall very forcibly was the support that came from the neighboring farms. Even without asking, if there was ill health or some reason why a farmer was in difficulty, the other farmers would turn up unannounced to help solve a problem. And we were always in a battle against uh, the elements. In that part of the world, there's no knowing when the sun is going to shine and when the rain is going to fall. Well, you get some warning, but not a lot. Um, so there we were, um, or there I was, in this university of life, uh, making my way forward, um, learning to multitask, because this farm was what is called a mi mixed arable farm. So we grew everything effectively that could be grown in that part of the world. And we reared almost all the animals and uh, birds that you could uh, conceive of uh, rearing in that part of the world. So I learned to multitask. I started my formal education by going to the local village school. And there it was a one room, one teacher situation where Eventually, the older children taught the younger children, helping the teacher. I left the school in 1950 when I was eight uh, to go to a college in Edinburgh called Melville College. And there I have to tell you, and I didn't realize it at the time, there were some of the most erudite and some of the most uh, academic, in a sense, and well-informed teachers that I could possibly have imagined. And it was an equal number of men and women. And not only did we have a good formal education, but they took us out into the city and into the wilds of Scotland in a way that uh, left its mark on all of us. I then went to Edinburgh University. And in a very short period of time, um, I got bitten by the research uh, bug um, in chemistry. And this happened in 1963 when I was attending an analytical laboratory where the emphasis was on quantification. How much iron is in this uh, piece of steel? And 
the person who was running this laboratory um, made a couple of comments to a class of about 150 of us that went along the following lines. Scary stuff. You will be pipetting enough cyanide to kill the whole of Edinburgh. And then he went one step too far. He proudly said, I started this course, launched it 10 years ago, and no student has ever finished it. And immediately I said, I will finish it. It was a 10-week course, and I finished after seven weeks. That gave me the call to the professor's office, the offer of uh, a small stipend to uh, go and start doing some research during the summer. And that research was on um, the uh, analysis of acacia gums that were coming from the Sudan. So I started out being an analytical chemist, but it didn't really matter what I was doing. I was really, really addicted from virtually day one. And it even drew me away from the farm. Well, eventually I stayed on, I got a PhD, and it came to March the 1st, 1967, and I was saying goodbye to Professor Sir Edmund Hurst, and he said, uh, Stoddart, whatever you do, continuing in research, tackle a big problem. I had no idea what the man was talking about, a big problem. Anyway, I got on a jet plane for the first time in my life at Prestwick Airport and headed out to Montreal. I'm 25 years of age. I arrive in Kingston, Ontario to find out that my um, postdoctoral mentor is going to Brazil. And so for almost three years, I'm left to do my own thing. I was very fortunate that within six weeks of arriving, I went to the library and I opened up the Journal of the American Chemical Society to find an article by a man called Charles Paterson. And Charles Paterson was to be one of the three Nobel laureates in chemistry in 1987. And there was described the making of a very large ring. It became known as dibenzo 18 times 6. And this flew in the uh, face of all the teaching that I had had at Edinburgh. Yes, you could make small rings, but forget about the big ones. So I said, that's probably where my big problem is. Okay, so <clears throat> I started some research on big rings. And then <clears throat> I was married uh, for during a period that I was in Canada to someone, Norma, that I had met at Edinburgh. And we returned to, well, another country called England in uh, <laughs> 1970. And this was to be quite a shock. It was the University of Sheffield. And very quickly, I realized I had walked into a hornet's nest. There were four uh, supreme professors of organic, inorganic, physical, and theoretical chemistry who were at war with each other morning, noon, and night. It was like living, I think, in baronial England of uh, maybe the 13th century. It was not a pleasant experience. And it was so unpleasant that um, it got to the stage, although I did manage to do some research, that um, I felt I should leave academia and go into industry. And a meeting with um, Donald Cram from UCLA, who again was to join with Paterson in sharing the 1987 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. A meeting with him in New York in 1976 um, helped me get myself reoriented. I went to UCLA for the first time during the first three months of 1978. And Don helped to arrange a secondment to the ICI Corporate Research Laboratory in Runcorn in Cheshire, which is quite close to Liverpool. And so the family moved to Chester, a lovely Roman city, and we had a wonderful time. Here I was with a group of young, mainly um, research-oriented 
individuals, some of the best the country had produced because the gates of academia had been closed down during the early 70s. And it was there, not to put too fine a point on it, that I met a weed killer called Paraquat. And this bipyridinium herbicide was to make its way into our molecular shuttles, switches, and machines over the next 40 years or so. So here I illustrate a situation where something that is not going well for you in life, um, you don't sit around and do nothing. You act, and that's what I did. And out of that came the prize, effectively, of uh, the big problem getting its final steam. So I returned to Sheffield, and I had more authority, but it was still not a very nice situation. And I will just mention in relation to diversity that um, I did break the barrier of having only British students, bringing students in from Italy and Spain and France and Germany, much against the um, opposition of these senior professors. They would arrogantly say, but the British students, our students are better. It was poppycock. What the British students needed at that stage was competition. They needed to see that the people came from other parts of the world, and this was Europe to begin with, but eventually it was from the Middle East here, it was from India, it was from Japan, it was from the United States. And we never looked back based on this uh, step into a diverse cultural laboratory. In 1990, I got the call to go to the University of Birmingham. And I should preface this with the fact that I became very, um, very, very open on the national scene during the 80s about what I thought was not working properly in English academia or British academia. In other words, I wrote to the uh, press, uh, <coughs> the Telegraph, the Times of London, the Manchester Guardian, making the point that um, it wasn't the lack of funding that was holding back British science. It was the um, corrupt and misuse of this funding by the people at the top. So I did not win a lot of uh, friends. And my <coughs> passage to Birmingham was really by the back door. I was uh, invited to go there by the then Vice Chancellor, Sir Michael Thompson. And the Birmingham years <clears throat> were very fruitful ones and probably marked the time when making a molecular shuttle and then a molecular switch, uh, this was probably what uh, the chemistry committee of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences eventually got their eye on. And so, <clears throat> all was going well until 1992, when my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. We were first of all visited by a lumpectomy, then a mastectomy in 94. And with some reluctance, <clears throat> she realized that um, we would be better off as a family, given the fact that um, the care in Birmingham, England's biggest, biggest city, uh, was not um, up to anyone's or our expectations. There were too few oncologists, and if I say when we got to Santa Monica, um, <clears throat> where we lived while I was at UCLA, uh, there were hundreds of oncologists, and uh, she was well looked after until such times as uh, just as much as anything, the hard drugs, the chemotherapeutic agents, uh, took her life just as much, I think, as the uh, cancer did. And so, in summing up that part of my life, I have to say that uh, probably a third of it, um, her married life, uh, was um, spent in clinics and in hospitals. And I still had to keep a research activity going. So the message I get over here is life is not a bowl of cherries. The chances are that you will, the younger people in the audience as you live through your life and the older ones will know, uh, meet these uh, occasions when 
everything seems to be against you. And this is the real testing time. Anyway, I came through it. Uh, my wife passed away in 2004, and then I moved to Northwestern in 2007, and uh, <clears throat> late 2007, and I've been there ever since. And I've been blessed during all of this time at UCLA and at uh, Northwestern with some of the most talented young men and women from all over the world. There's one of them sitting in the audience today. Ali, where are you? Ali, thank you. I will speak <clears throat> this afternoon about the uh, wonderful um, contributions, the highly creative breakthrough contributions he made in 2010 when we went to Northwestern. Well, my story is almost finished and my time I've taken too much. On the 5th of October 2016, the phone rang at just after 4 o'clock in the morning and I was in a sound sleep and I'm quite good at detecting English spoken from different parts of the world and I suddenly realized that I was speaking over the telephone with men and women with Swedish accents <laughs> and I knew my life had changed and that's why I'm here today. And thank you very much for the invitation to be with you. Sir Fraser, so as you just heard, even for the father of the molecular machines, life doesn't fit so easily or perfectly together. I want to thank everyone for coming. I, tough act to follow, but I believe we have some music. We have the singing of the alma mater and the AUB choir. Yes. Mm -hmm. 